without further ado, I'd like to introduce John Head. Thank you. It's all yours. <laughs> I, I am I'm really uh, anxious to, to tell you what I have learned about healthy cooking. Uh, I'm not speaking as a, a chef or as a retired chef or as a culinary instructor. I'm just speaking as a healthcare provider who's been cooking uh, everything in our, in our uh, diet for years. So I order the food, I prepare it, and I, um, it's, it's more than just food. It's what we do here in our home to stay independent. And I, I can tell you that the results of this cooking method that I have developed is, has been effective for us in that we're maintaining our weight, we're maintaining our blood pressure, our cholesterol is under control. Carol's diabetic and her A1C is under control. And the last thing that one of my doctors told me was at 75, I'm in remarkably good health. So, oh. so I attribute a lot of that to good genetics. My mother made it to 102. She's very, she was very healthy and alert for a, a good long life. My dad had was long lived. So good genetics, that's helpful. But I think a, a component of our health and our continued health has been that I have cooked healthier than, I, than we once did. And I made a lot of modifications in what we eat. I made tremendous number of substitutions. And I found since I am a celiac. I am, I am gluten intolerant. It's not a fad diet or anything. I, I really am literally allergic to wheat. And that includes gluten from every source. So Carol, Carol would not be able to tell you this, but she's been eating a gluten-free diet pretty well for <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> so I think there's a component to that too. My son just recently, this year, uh, became the executive chef at, oh, now I'm not going to be able to remember, Kingswood, at Kingswood Senior Living. So he's cooking for 250 seniors, and, and he's very, and he and I um, have this common background of having, of me having, and even our schooling together. We've been working together professionally and uh, for 30 years. So uh, he validates um, much of what I've said, but he has a different take since he's working under a budget and basically I'm not. So, um, so let me say that I'm not a dietitian. I've had a ton of, of uh, professional development training in, in dietetics, but what I'm telling you is based on my experience in trying to stay uh, on a gluten-free diet and cooking healthy, as well as cooking well for, for the two of us. So here's how I approach how I cook. Could, could I have the next one, please? I have reimagined my recipes with lighter ingredients. So for example, a quiche that would call for, uh, and, and the way we uh, cooked it in, in the professional kitchens I was in was half, half and half, that's 10 and a half percent milk fat, half, half and half, and half whole eggs to make the custard. And then a ton of cheese and um, seasonings. Now, I, I don't do that at all now. I use fat-free milk, believe it or not, and a ratio of fat-free milk and uh, eggs, whole eggs, and light cheese. It's just as delicious as it was, oh, turkey bacon. So it's just as delicious, I believe, as it was. It's just as uh, pleasing. It sets up just as well. It slices just as well. Looks good all with lighter ingredients. And that's what I've done throughout everything that we cook. I've also uh, reimagined the portion sizes. Those days 
where we used to go out and get a 12 ounce steak and a baked but they loaded baked potato and uh, are, are just no more. We just don't do that. Uh, we, we, our portion sizes of meat are four ounces or less. And I know my ingredients. I am a, for 20 years, I've been reading labels and tossing out my staple ingredients and substituting uh, with complete abandon, <laughs> I substitute every day. I look at a recipe, it calls for two tablespoons of salt. I just laugh. <laughs> I, I look at, uh, I don't buy whole fat, any dairy products. Not, none of them are, are whole. I don't buy whole milk. I don't buy whole cottage cheese. I don't buy whole sour cream. Um, and they still perform well. I'm going to talk about these uh, in a little bit more depth in a minute. So I also make our plates pleasing because it's, it's a joy for me to make a beautiful plate. It's as much uh, important to me as the nutritional balance and the, the calorie content and all that stuff. So I really do try to make the plates pretty. I garnish with all kinds of things. And I have another, I have another reason for, for garnishing with things like pickles and olives and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And that is to, to sneak in some of those low starch vegetables with good healthy uh, qualities themselves. Because there's a problem with cutting back on this portion size and cutting back on the ingredients to lighter ingredients. The meals can be less satisfying. And so that's, that's the challenge. Make the meal light, make the portion size small and still come away from the meal satisfied. So you're not back grabbing a bag of potato chips later. <laughs> and then this method that I have that I use won't lose any weight for you. <laughs> you will not lose weight. Now you, you may uh, think that nothing is changing, um, but it's healthier. So your long-term health, I believe, will improve. But as far as losing weight, that's going to require time in the gym. Because if you don't change the amount of activity, you just change these, the, the amount of change won't offset the calorie intake of even these lighter ingredients. So as an example, a Coke is 120 calories and you have to walk for 34 minutes or longer to burn off one Coca-Cola. And so changing that to Coke Zero um, will help on the calorie content, but you may not see a, a huge overall benefit uh, like that. So let's, let's get some thoughts down. Thank you, Jonathan. Let's, I, I walked into the living room one day and my grand, granddaughter was um, trying to eat a bag of marshmallows. <laughs> and I said, do, you know, I wanted to be grandfatherly about this, not just yell. And so I said, do you, do you think we ought to be eating the marshmallows? And she held up the bag and it said fat free on a big enough print on there. I could see it fat free. So I knew she just didn't understand at all where calories come from. And, and it turns out that her daughter doesn't either because her daughter was on a, my daughter, her mother was on a keto diet for two years with no effect, didn't lose a pound. And, and she was sure that she would be able to lose a huge amount of weight because keto was so popular, is so popular. So I think it just came down to the fact that they didn't know where they were getting their calories in, the, in their diet. I think most people would think that calories come from proteins and fat. 
but they don't give carbohydrates credit for really packing a diet full of, full of calories. In fact, proteins and carbohydrates have the same amount of calories per portion size. So you can't just cut the steak in half, serve, get, get a six ounce KC strip, and then a big pile of mashed potatoes and have done anything to reduce the calories of that meal. Because the carbohydrates really do have a large uh, portion of, of, of calories. Of course, the fresh non-starchy veggies are what we want to fill the plate up with and, uh, and because of their benefit and low calorie thing. They just don't give us that satisfaction, uh, the fullness that we want from, from the meal. So, okay, now we understand that we've got to watch out for the carbohydrates there and, and we have to cut our meal lighter, both in proteins and carbs. Could you uh, advance that please there? So good proteins are, of course, proteins are necessary in our diet and seniors need these proteins just as much as youngsters do. Um, and so these are the good proteins that I use throughout our, our, uh, our whole menu. Everything, morning, noon, and night, I'm drawing from these good proteins. And um, I'll talk more about the milk products uh, here in just a minute, because I have a good substitute for all of those high fat milk <laughs> products. And I'll talk more about fish, poultry, and so forth in a minute. There was just an article that I, I saw yesterday or this morning about pork and, and, and reminding us that pork is truly a red meat. I, I, I don't want to call it a, the other white meat. It's not, it's a red meat. And the, the technical reason uh, that it's, it is a red meat, um, but it is so much lighter than it was in days past that uh, the, the diet of the, of the, pigs is so much better that the pork is really lower uh, in uh, protein than it has been in the past. So it's a good product for us. Thank you, Jonathan. Good fats uh, come from these products, especially olive oil. I do not uh, want you to think that it's important to go to the most exotic and the most aged and the most expensive uh, olive oil. Just olive oil is fine. We're just using it uh, here as, uh, as, the, as the fat to saute in and to, to cook with. So you do not need the most expensive olive oils. And another thing I think we do with olive oils is when we buy these great big bottles and we don't use them and they go stale. I think you'll find the flavor of a freshly opened bottle of olive oil is, is marvelous. And that one that's been around for a long time is just really off. So buy small bottles, use them up, throw them away when, they're, when they get stale. I, I put nuts and seeds and, and fatty fish in our diet as often as I can. And fatty, by fatty fish, I'm talking tuna, salmon, that sort of thing. Uh, although most of the time, I, the fish that I, I cook is cod or halibut. I think halibut's probably pretty fatty now that I say that. Thank you, Thomas. And the carbs, this is where people, I, this is where my granddaughter was uh, mistaken, thinking that something uh, that was low fat would be low in carbohydrates. But Anything that has starch or sugar or even fiber in it is going to have a lot of carbohydrates, grains, veggies, fruit, and fruit. I grew up thinking of orange juice as a really healthy drink. I mean, just a really great thing. Kids ought to be drinking a lot of orange juice, drinking a lot of milk. You know, you got milk and orange juice for breakfast because that was a good, healthy thing. 
but it's just not true. It's just marketing. I think we're the, probably the only country in the world that really thinks of orange juice or fruit juices as healthy. Uh, there's just sugar and uh, the calories are just horrific in one of those things. So I, I don't have a lot of fruit in our diet. Um, and I don't have any marshmallows in our diet either. <laughs> well, even though they're no, no fat and gluten-free. <laughs> Here's French fries and I'll talk about frying and, and uh, we just don't fry anything. I haven't, fr- I haven't filled a big pot full of vegetable oil up in a long time. I, not since I was working professionally. I just don't do it. It seems so, it, se- it seems so wasteful. You get to you fry your fish in it and strain it and maybe fry it one more time and then throw that quart of oil out. I just It just kills me to do that. So I hardly fry anything, but I miss fried food. <laughs> I miss the texture, the crunch the crunch of the, of the, of the breading or the, the batter and the delicious moist product that frying produce. So I've had to find some ways to, uh, to cook crispy things without a deep fryer. So thank you, John. So cholesterol is something I just don't have it. I just don't have any help for you uh, on cholesterol because it is so subject to our own, our own particular genetics. And um, Mm. some people can, can just have low cholesterol without any effort at all. And some people fight this their whole lives. Um, But do, but we know what, what to do. We know stay away from the fried food and, and any kind of hard fat like margarine or certainly lard or, Crisco, any kind of fat that's hard is going to be high in cholesterol. And and then all the commercially produced bakery items are probably going to have ingredients that will increase your cholesterol level. There is the good and the bad cholesterol. So I'm talking here about LDLs. Um, So, but cholesterol is something that uh, will will take something besides a diet change to lower in some, some people. Uh, salt is everywhere and it's, it's faddish. Uh, I, I get, people give me salt for gifts. I have salt from the Himalayas. I have pink salt. I have, I have hand picked. I have French salt. I have, I have a cabinet full of salt. And I'm just so over, over that. I don't buy it in products like celery salt. It just rolls off your tongue. Celery salt. I always use it at the holidays, you know. I just don't buy that. I just look for it in, on the label. And when a product is coming in that's basically salt with some flavorings, I don't, I try not to buy it. And then it's in our diet because we put it there because we've always put it there. I had this, I had this discussion uh, long ago uh, with my, my mentor, uh, my, uh, my, a member of the faculty, John Joyce, uh, who, who was so important in my training. Um, and I said, I don't see why anybody boils pasta in salt water. And he said, well, the master chefs tell, tell us we have to. And that, and, and so he did it. He did it all his life and he did it all of his professional career, but I can't taste any difference there. And I don't think it adds anything and I don't do it uh, any more than I pour a bunch of oil and water. That's going to be cooking pasta. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, but there are things that we can do to, to really hit people up with great flavor. The, 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 the first taste of, of something that we cook. If we, if we, use lemon zest and juice and fresh garlic. Now, let me mention garlic. It, uh, I saw, I watched a Cook's Country review of all of the garlic products that are on the market, the squeeze tubes, you know, the, they mentioned one that was frozen and I've never seen, but uh, none of them work for me. They taste vinegary and they taste sour and t- just 
have an unpleasant smell. And I think there isn't anything except fresh garlic that tastes as good as garlic. Although garlic powder is pretty good. And smoked paprika is pretty good. These are things that help people um, get over the fact that, that there's not as much salt in their potato salad or whatever as, as there once was. I'm just trying to cut it back. Okay. So, go ahead, please, Jonathan. So, Lindy asked me to, to do this talk, and she, she wanted me to mention the techniques and the equipment that we would need to do these kinds of things. And so, and she mentioned zest in particular. Um, so I want to I want to mention it to you because I don't cut a lemon without peeling the zest off of the rind. Uh, it's just it's right there, and I'm going to be using the lemon juice, and I always use the zest. It doesn't keep, so it's not, not anything that you can do and freeze or whatever. I, I just don't. I think it's uh, the flavors are pretty. They dissipate pretty rapidly, uh, so I don't keep it in, around in the refrigerator. I just every time I get the juice of a lemon, I, I capture the zest and I put it in that product. I put it in my slaw the other day as I was putting lemon juice in the thing. And so, and then now that brings me to this microplane discussion. A lot of, especially pastry chefs, love the microplane for zesting a lemon or an orange or whatever. And I don't, I don't like it. It's, it's a, a scary thing to, to use, if you haven't used a microplane, it, you, will, you will zest your fingers so easily. But also it gives you zest dust. It's just the most minute little pile of, of zest. I don't want that at all. I want these beautiful strings of, of zest that garnish everything so well. Now, the zester that I use is made by Victorinox, and, and it's, I don't know, 20 years old, 30 years old. It's sharp today as it was when I got it. The one that you see up there with the black handle, I've forgotten the name of that mix. It is going to go in the trash as soon as I get through this presentation because <laughs> it just mushes up the limit. It's terrible to work with. You don't get this great strips, individual strips. You just get mush. And um, it doesn't work for me. Um, so if, if the zester is not sharp, you'll know it the first time you pick it up. You'll get beautiful zest. If you don't, put it back on the shelf. I mean, take a lemon with you to, the, to uh, Prides and try it out before you, you buy it or throw it away. But those, uh, those Victorian Knox zesters have always worked for me. They make two of them, one with a wooden handle that's 20 bucks and, and one uh, with a uh, plastic handle that's uh, half that price. And that's what I recommend. As far as juicing uh, lemons go, uh, it, I, most of the time I'm just, I just squeeze it by hand uh, to, to get the juice out. You, you have to deal with the seeds there. But um, if I have... a uh, something where I need, and I did this, I did lemonade for, uh, for my family not too long ago. And I pulled out my Hamilton beach. That's that thing is a beast. <laughs> but if you want to zest something, I always laughed with the students and told them that my retiree job was to take my Hamilton beats juicer down on highway one and get cases of Valencia oranges and squeeze those alongside the road for people, it, it's a marvelous machine, it separates out the seeds, you get the pulp still, it's a great machine. Uh, but uh, unless, you, unless you're really serious about gallons of juice, you don't need such a thing, uh, just a hand thing. I think the next one shows more, no, no, I didn't, I, I, somehow or other on this version, I didn't get my pictures of zest in there. But strips of zest are what you get with that Victoria nut thing. And that's what I much prefer over the microplane, fine, fine products. Bakers like the fine, fine product, of course. Here's an ingredient you just really have to have to cook well. And in, in tw 20 years in professional kitchens, I never had such a device that was so accurate and so fast as a thermopin. Thermopin. 
notice the, the unusual spelling there. And they've just come out with this Thermapin one. Mm -hmm. It's a hundred and five dollars worth every penny. I use it all of the time. As an example, I use it when I'm making pour over coffee because you don't really want the, the, the water boiling hot and you don't want it to where it just looks like it's hot. I mean, you really want to know and chicken and steaks and meat of all sorts. You really want to know um, down to the degree it makes a difference. Um, and when I talk to you about my method of cooking and roasting rather, you'll see that I, I, I really need to pull those products out at the right temperature. Uh, and that chicken that I'm cooking there on the grill at 154 is not ready to take off that grill. <laughs> so, so these are wonderful devices. I really recommend a thermopin. Um, nothing else will give you the accuracy or the confidence when, when we were always told, never, never stick a probe into a piece of meat, it drains all the juice and all that out. That's not true with this very small probe here. I, I, I use it for fish. I use it for very, very thin things. We were also told you could only, you know, had to have a big piece of meat in order to do it. That was true with the old, uh, with the old uh, thermometers. But this one like is magnificent, wonderful, accurate for liquids and even the temperature of your pan, which is important. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is. So I have bought everybody in my family a Breville oven. They are just so wonderful. They're so accurate. They're the perfect size for our small uh, meals now. And, uh, and just yesterday, my son was showing me a shepherd's pie that he did in the Breville that he, that he has. But uh, when I remodeled my kitchen several years ago, I, I did not want to save counter space for uh, the small, excellent convection oven like a Breville. So I went with a microwave unit uh, to, that is also a convection oven. But here's, here's my, the hero of my kitchen remodel. And that is a, the most marvelous oven I've ever had in my career, in my 40, 50 years of serious cooking. Uh, this thing is accurate within a degree. It has convection bake. That's just, that's just weird. Convection broil, that's just weird but it means that the oven's mm -hmm. air is even in every corner and every shelf. It has a multi-rack convection setting for baking, which is different. If you put three sheet pans of cookies in there, it, the fan adjusts to that. So just the, the convection capability on this oven is marvelous. And when you put this thing on 450, to do a pizza or, or whatever. You can put your hand on that glass door and it's room temperature. It's just the most marvelously uh, uh, insulated oven I ever had. It also has these racks that just glide out and glide in. And you've, we've all fought those racks. This is so, so amazingly wonderful. And the lighting in there will hurt your eyes. When you close the door, you can see in every corner. It's, I never have to open the door. But the best thing this thing has about it is a probe. And you can put that probe. And by the way, both ovens have a probe. So I have two. So you can put that probe in something. And that's the way I'm cooking. And a, a spoiler alert here. I... I use the grill outside when something is going to flame. I'll talk about that later. Smoke up the kitchen, set off the fire alarm. <clears throat> I'll mark the thing uh, on the grill, gas grill or charcoal grill. And then I'll bring it in and finish it in the oven. I've already gotten the flavor and the caramelization that I wanted. And then, and then I can get the precise temperature. So that all of that low and slow cooking and all that stuff, forget about it. Uh, no, no need to do that. Develop the flavors and the caramelization, the browning, 
of your piece of meat and then keep the temperature high and put that probe in there and um, know exactly what your target temperature is. The oven turns itself off uh, when it reaches that temperature. Now you have to get it out of there because the oven is still so hot, but it's a brilliant thing to have an oven uh, like this, but a Breville does everything that I just mentioned in a smaller size. I just wish I, 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 I wish I could have one because it seems so wasteful to me to have to fire up the big oven. So uh, the microwave, now you can see how uh, mine is uh, mounted over, over my induction cooktop. This is a dis big disappointment. I, I've had that, the mag, whatever the component is that goes out in microwaves, it wasn't a year old and the thing went out. And the guy came out, it was un under warranty, but the guy came out and um, to replace it. And he said, uh, do you use paper towels in your microwave? I said, almost every time I use it, yes. He said, would you not do that anymore? He said, there's, there, often there's, mag, there, there's metal in the paper towels and it's burning up these units. He said, this is GE. He said, it, we, we had some announcements about it, but it just never did take, nobody ever noticed that. He said, it's a bad, bad, bad practice to use paper towels in microwave. And we all know it's better to thaw things uh, in, in the uh, refrigerator over, over a couple of days than it is to microwave, but we all microwave things to thaw them. And as long as we cook them right away, that's safe. I love, this is, This was a Julia Child idea that I learned about 30 years ago when she first got a microwave. She said, I, I, oh yeah, I have a new microwave. I, I use it all the time. I just don't cook in it. <laughs> Dry my newspaper, that sort of stuff. But anyway, she, she developed a way of, of poaching fish. You just put a bed down of mushrooms or uh, onions, of course, and uh, a, a little bit of a stock, and then put the fish on top of that, plastic wrap it, put it in the microwave, six minutes, touch the fish, it's probably done. You have a marvelous stock uh, broth, and uh, the fish is done perfectly, and uh, I, I love to, to use that, and I use that broth uh, seasoned with vermouth uh, to make a sauce. So I, I, I use my microwave a lot. You can see over the top, I don't know if you can see my arrow or not, but um, that uh, elegant piece of aluminum foil right there is protecting my new cabinets because it uh, scorches them. I try to use this, this, uh, this microwave as a Breville and it has the capability, it'll, it'll it's hot, but the whole dang thing is hot and the vent is hot and it doesn't vent away from the cabinets enough. So my idea of using this for as a Breville didn't work and I'm disappointed. Here's the, here's the second, besides my oven, I love this dishwasher. I have a neighbor down the street who has a baby grand piano, and a commercial ice maker in her kitchen. You can see the difference between her kitchen and mine. She, she is all about entertaining. And she remodeled her kitchen before me. So I took a hundred tips from her. And I had this Bosch in my old kitchen. It was only a year or two old. And I thought, I'll just bring it over to the new one and wait. And, and she said, I hate, I hate my Bosch. I'm never gonna get another one again. I can understand that because I, you wouldn't believe how crystal clear my, my uh, the things that I, I cooked on that pan in the top rack, I cooked basmati rice, nothing harder to clean up. And the bottom pan, I did bulgogi and uh, took them right, emptied the product out into a bowl and put them right into the dishwasher and they came out like new. My, my all clad pans are years old, but they're dishwasher safe and they just this dishwasher. But the way I found out that it, to, to keep everything clean and clear is I have to clean that filter out 
Um, and I think that's why my neighbor hated her Bosch. She didn't know where the filter was or didn't know how to clean the filter. And as a result of that, she was just uh, recoating her, her pans with debris from the filter. So if you do it regularly, and if you use some kind of rinse agent, and if you use Cascade Platinum, I'm telling you, that's that, my dishes are so wonderfully clean. And if you have a pan that won't go in the dishwasher, don't cook with it. <laughs> Display it. <laughs> but, I mean, there, it, it, this saves me so much time. But if you are a beer dude, I don't, I don't know a name. I know I have a lot of names for people who love wine, but I don't know what to call someone who's really serious about beer. Um, they'll take one look at that glass and, and say, oh, do yourself a favor and, and rinse your beer glasses before, you're, before you pour because those bubbles that are stuck to the side because of the, of the rinsing agent would, would normally release and make your beer much more aromatic. So good bars always rinse the beer glasses to get that rinse agent off of there to, to let the, uh, let the uh, aroma uh, release. So scales, I use these scales every single day. I just, I use it for everything. I weigh everything. And it will, it's pretty, I think will go up to 10 pounds. It, it real, I can, I can weigh some heavy stuff out of the garage. I'm always bringing stuff in and weighing them. And I use it to do pour over coffee. So several things I want to say about, about uh, this, but the important thing about this scale is to be able to use it you, you have to be smarter than the scale because it will weigh the container and product and give you a false reading if you're not careful. And even though I know it very well, I still have to reset, reset, reset as I'm doing pour over coffee. The very first thing that you do with pour over coffee is you get the filter wet and, and heat, the, heat, heat the pot up, pour that out, zero it out add the coffee grounds, in my case, 45 grams, then zero it out. And then make that first pour in there, which is the bloom. And I use 100 grams of water and I'm, I'm watching the scale there to get to 100. And then you let that sit for a minute or two and then zero it out. And then you do the final pour of 500 to get to a total of 600 grams of water on 45 grams of thing. So I had to hit that tear button repeatedly through this whole process. And it's easy to forget. And then you don't know how much you've got in there and you're kind of guessing from then on. But, so it, it takes training practice and everything else. Okay, second thing I want to say about, about something like pour over coffee is this is the way to make the meal more satisfying. I'll show you an example in, in a minute, but the coffee experience, which is zero calories as far as I know, and zero carbs, I mean, it's just absolutely uh, a marvelous drink, but it's not like the old fashioned Keurig cup of coffee that's so mild you, you want three or four cups of it in, in the morning. With pour over, the coffee experience is so intense that you're going to want to go to a smaller cup. I, I didn't understand that when I got to Germany the first time and back in the 70s. The, it would took if you ordered coffee, I, mean, I always would order coffee and it would take 10 minutes to get a cup of coffee. What is going on back there? They've forgotten us. No, they're doing this process right here, which is very time consuming. And then secondly, they would give her a small cup. But once we learn to savor that coffee experience with a smaller cup, a much more intense thing, we're convinced there's no better coffee. The, the roastery used to do a tasting for people to come in and try their, try their products, and maybe they still do. But they would compare a, a French press 
a, a and a percolator and cake, a Keurig, and a pour over. And everyone comes away from that experience saying, oh my gosh, there's no better cup of coffee in the world. And it's kind of like a dessert. So I, I use coffee to make the meal more satisfying, even though it's just a small amount. So on sub, this is a lot of words, but here's, here's my recommendation on substituting milk, no fat milk for all other products. I don't care if the thing calls for heavy cream. Is that 40% butter fat? Seems like it. 40%, half and half is 10 and a half percent. Whole milk is four. I say substitute all of them because the, it's the cream in the product like a quiche is not what causes it to set. There, the fat has nothing to do with a cake rising and setting. It's, it's not necessary. You can substitute water in almost every recipe for milk. So you don't need to go to any whole milk, whole half and half or heavy cream. Just substitute have one milk product in your kitchen. And, I mean, one liquid milk product in your kitchen. And that make, make that no fat. Don't buy heavy whole cream cheese or cottage cheese. And certainly don't buy half and half. I recommend I strongly recommend if you really want the half and half experience, especially for someone who, who uses it in coffee, that you go to no fat, ultra pasteurized, and you will love that product, although it's more expensive. And I just wanted to sneak in the thing about uh, kosher salt uh, for rubs, and steaks and primary. And if you do any brining, I don't brine things, but if you do, you certainly want to do, that with coarse kosher salt, read the label carefully because in the, they're sneaking iodine into uh, some brands of kosher salt and you don't want that in your brine um, if something's gonna stay in that brine for 24 hours, it will, it will flavor your product. Now, table salt, we need it, we need it uh, with iodine. Is table salt with iodine and no other salt? I beg your pardon? What, what did you mention? What did you say? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, table salt is, it, I just recommend strongly against putting on, on the table. I, I have a family member who I see salt McDonald French fries. She'll, <laughs> I mean, without any hesitation, she picks up the salt shaker. I, I sent uh, potato salad out the other day to, to my family. And, uh, and my daughter came back and said they want salt on the table. I said, well, tell me who wanted the salt and what do they want the salt for? Because I'm mad. <laughs> I tasted all those things and they were suitably salted, but they, they still want it. They demand it. Don't put it on the table. Don't give them an option. <laughs> So here's my recommendation, strong recommendation. Uh, yeah. Buy Horizon or buy Organic Valley, buy their fat-free milk. One, it is delicious. There's nothing any more disappointing than a regular dairy product of, of skim milk. It's so thin. It's, so, it's not a pretty color. It's blue. It's just not a satisfying drink at all. And for pennies more glass, you can have this product. I really recommend, strongly recommend that you buy organic milk. In order to get to the organic label for milk, that's a big deal. And it is all the things that you're assured are missing, you want missing from your diet. So pay the extra for the organic. Now, is this a good beverage? No, 
This is, should not be on the table as a beverage, the same amount of calories in a glass of milk as there is in a Coca-Cola. And where do the carb, where do the, where do the calories come from? There's a lot of protein and there's a lot of carbs in milk. So the fat free is just like the marshmallows. It's misleading labeling. And um, we, I don't want to highlight the healthy qualities of this milk uh, as far as being low calorie, because there's not, it's a ton of calories in this. This is my morning beverage, 365 days a year. I have this big old espresso machine behind me. And there it is. It weighs 50 pounds. And we have two uh, seven ounce cappuccinos with every breakfast that we eat, whatever the whatever we eat. And and so and, and I know it, it takes a lot of time to do that. It takes this big 50 pound thing sitting on me, taking up a, about a third of my island. But is this is the thing that really enhances the breakfast that I serve, whatever the, the menu. And I, I use this, it, it really does foam nicely. It gets micro foam. It's a wonderful product. Horizon and or Organic Valley, really good milk products. And substitute one for one, whatever whole dairy product is called for, and it will perform perfectly. Some other substitutes that I really recommend, here's, here's the Egglander's best eggs that are 30% lower in cholesterol than regular eggs. How do they do that? Well, good diet for those chickens. Um, people don't understand the grading of eggs. If you were getting ready for Easter and gonna boil a bunch of eggs for your family, don't rush out and buy double A eggs. Double A eggs are less than a week old, and they will not peel. You will shred that egg trying to peel it. So you want, don't buy a double egg eggs. <laughs> Takes a long time to learn come that. Come on, come on. Come so on. If, you wanna, if you wanna peel the eggs, absolutely get A eggs and keep them around for a week and they will peel beautifully. Um, and Eglin's best is the, the a problem with them is if you really do serious baking, these are so varied in size. You'll have everything from large to extra large and everything in between in a carton. There's no uniformity in the size. So you're going to be weighing your eggs when you use this product because they're so ununiform. Probably something else I could say about those eggs, but that's a good product. At the top is a shawl. Schaller brand of gluten-free bread that is the capstone of, of our diet, the, it's small loaf. It's half the size of a regular loaf. So just by one slice of toast uh, on, on my wife's uh, morning plate, I've cut the amount of uh, carbs on the plate just by going to this smaller loaf. But it also is delicious. I would serve it to anyone. It is just a wonderful bread. And it's, it's so, and they have several lines, multi-grain, but all the others are wonderful. And the third product I want to tell you that you will, you will thank me the first time that you serve your family pancakes made with this Pamela's mix. It is so flavorful, but it's also my flour blend. It has a lot of grain, a lot of great qualities, and is a marvelous flour blend. I use it for everything. I make biscuits with it. I make pancakes with it. It's marvelous. So don't feel sorry for me because I can't have gluten. <clears throat> this is uh, a, here's my, here's my baking book from the Culinary Institute. Um, I've had this for a lot of years and I just wear it out. 
Um, they're very difficult recipes. You have to have a lot of really unusual products like potato flour and xanthan gum and those kinds of things. But it produces the most marvelous baked products that the book, uh, this, is, this is the banana nut bread that I, I could win <clears throat> blue ribbons at the Platte County Fair with this nut bread. Moist, delicious. And um, so I don't know what the point of it was, was showing, uh, it doesn't have the Pamela's flour. It has a, a, a flour blend made of the potato starch and rice flour and those kinds of things. So I guess that nothing comes to mind. Okay, here, here it is. I, I'm the last American to own a, an air fryer. I saw consumer reports this, we, this month or last month. Uh, rated them and said that 25 million air fryers have sold in the last couple of years to Americans. So everybody has one. You all have one. I did not have one because I always thought it was kind of like the Vegematic or uh, remember Saturday Night Live skit about the Basomatic. <laughs> I've been laughing about that forever, but it just seemed, seemed too shopping network to me. It was just too hokey. I didn't get it. I didn't think it would. It will work until I saw one in my daughter's garage, actually. She wasn't using it because I brought her a Breville. And a Breville does air frying beautifully. <laughs> so once she got the Breville, she put, kicked this thing out to the garage. And I, I picked it up, put it under my arm, and brought it home. And worked with it several times. I mean, uh, and I now can make French fries that rival anybody's, honestly. We love them. I try not to do it too often, but that batch, that's two pounds of potatoes and it has one half of a teaspoon of salt and two tablespoons of oil. And most of the oil is left in the pan. So from, from my method, the, all the recipes tell you to peel the potatoes, cut them carefully into the uniform sizes and you don't want to be much bigger than a quarter of an inch if you get a little bigger than that not going to be the texture that you'd like uh, so cut them uniformly has some fine uh, takes take some pains to cut them uniformly and then you soak them for at least half an hour in cool water i don't know what that does but it helps them crisp i don't know what i can't imagine what why you do that, but it, it, I did it and it works. You soak them for 30 minutes or more, even overnight. Then you dry them and you put on two pounds of potatoes, two tablespoons of oil, toss it around, get the, get the oil to coat the outside of them. And then you put a, a, a mixture of paprika and garlic powder and onion powder and half a teaspoon of salt. And, um, and you see the beautiful color. Those ones up in the upper right have not gone in yet. They have not gone into the fryer. And then you toss them in the fryer 15 minutes, take them out, toss them again, 15 more minutes at 400, and they come out crispy and succulent. So, I, so this plate now is uh, opening day of baseball season, or I don't know what it was, what the occasion was, but we, uh, we wanted to have a double cheese, quarter pound cheeseburger with fried kind of experience. And so this is how I reimagined that, that particular menu. We only got one patty of meat. We got a lot of raw onions on there. We got a small portion of, of um, the French fries and they are, here's my dear wife. And um, so that I, it's, it's the same menu without the bun, and it was very satisfying, great flavors, and um, it, it, it works. I, I tell you, I've also fried uh, fish in, in the um, breaded fish in the Breville, and I've done chicken wings. It works. I, I don't mean the Breville. I mean in this air fryer. It works. So plating, Here, reduce the portion size every single time. And you, if you control the portion size, then you can go a long way to feeding your family healthier and lighter. Um, if you feed your family 
family style, you put the big bowl of mashed potatoes on the, on the plate and you've lost control and, and you're not going to have the plating uh, that, that you should have. Um, so I strongly recommend, we, we almost always have our smallest plate for our entree. Um, and don't just think that you can cut back on the protein to lighten up the meal. You have to, you have to also cut back on the carbs just as important, just as importantly as you do protein. And then cut, just don't even bring bacon, ham, sausage, or beef into your kitchen. Uh, control the menu in that way uh, and greatly lighten up your, your menu. So how to fry, deep fry. Um, there is a standard breading station that we always use for anything deep fried and that is flour and egg wash and then breadcrumbs. Uh, I, my modifications to it, if you, if you in, insist on doing that, which I do, I, I, I bread fish, then I bake it in a hot oven instead of deep frying it. But uh, one thing that I would recommend in your egg wash is add a tablespoon of mayonnaise per egg and just beat that pudding out of that to make a uniform and a emulsified egg wash. Mm. If you just hit it a couple of times with the fork, the, the egg wash will adhere uniformly uh, and you will have uneven breading. So it's really important to beat that up. Um, and I have turned to panko, there's gluten-free panko breadcrumbs, believe it or not, they're marvelous. I, I turn to it for, for everything where I need breadcrumbs. If I need breadcrumbs in meatloaf or, or anything that calls for it, especially breading, but they're too coarse. So whirl them in a food processor or roll a rolling pin over them and to, to make them less coarse and you will like the breading with them. And then simply bake that breaded item in a hot oven. If you can get 450, do it. And you will like the browning and you will like the texture of that breaded thing way lighter than it by, by deep frying. But instead of that, you know, I'm going to take full credit for this other, for the picture. I invented this cooking method. I don't even know what to call it, but I put a cast iron, well-seasoned cast iron pan out on the gas grill and I try to melt that pan get it as hot as it will go and do blackened fish in there. If you do it, this in your house, you will, you, your eyes, you will set off the fire alarm. You will absolutely have uh, the worst experience. Uh, of, and so don't do any fish blackening in the house unless you have a commercial vent over your broiler. But, um, but if you do it outside, uh, winter or summer, that's a, just as satisfying fish experience as breaded and fried fish, I promise. Um, and I'd be happy to send you all recipes on blackening, seasoning, and so forth, calls for clarified butter um, to uh, help. But uh, that's a, that is a way to get us just a wonderful sear and that blackened flavor without it being burned. It's, it's marvelous. So here's, here are three meals. Not that we had these on uh, one day, but here's my reimagined breakfast. There's no ham, there's no sausage. There's the two small pieces of toast. There's the those are the, the egg line's best eggs, and you can see there how ununiform they are. So that would not be a very satisfying breakfast. And the way that I enhance the breakfast is with cappuccino. It 
it makes the meal much more satisfying. The dietitians, I don't even know if I can say the word right. Satiety, satiety, that, that feeling of fullness and of satisfaction that comes with a meal. And the cappuccinos make that a pretty satisfying meal. With, with, the, with the sandwich, this is a, what? a lunch that we had. Um, there, there's the salad. I keep fresh baby spinach and I put it on everything. I mean, I, my wife always makes uh, a joke about rabbit food as she's munching away on this, but I just, I put it everywhere. I, I line the dish with it and then put the chicken salad on top of it. I put it, I just, it's just one of those things. We need our green vegetables. And so I, I offered a, a, a lot with fresh green spinach and it lasts a long time. And it's just always something that I try to enhance the plate with. And can you make a satisfying meal when we, when we are able to get the tomatoes off uh, of the vine and get some vine ripe local tomatoes? Can you make a whole meal of that? I think you can. I think that you can cut back on everything else and just have a binge on green beans and new potatoes and all of the wonderful greens and things that come out of, of the market uh, uh, now as we're getting into the growing season. And you can make a very satisfying meal, at least delay the meal, the heavier, the, the, the follow on meal. If you don't come away from this meal satisfied, if your family's gonna say, okay, so we had the first course, what, what are we having never dinner? Um, you can at least delay dinner and stretch out the periods between meals with a meal like that of marvelous flavors, very fresh ingredients and very low, low fat ingredients. So let's see what's next. I can't wait to see what the next slide is. Ah, know your ingredients. I'm, out, I'm running out of time. I'm gonna stop. Hidden in this list of Heinz 57 ingredients is a thing called malt vinegar, which is poison to me. You wonder oh, why a celiac can't have Heinz 57? It's because of malt vinegar. I also can't drink root beer and other places where malt is. Beer, beer, I can't have because of malt. It is barley malt. And the three things that, it, that it, someone who's gluten intolerant can't have is wheat, barley, and rye. So this is why I read the label. Because Heinz 57 is a no-go. Worcestershire sauce is fine. Many other of the products are fine. Not that one. So you, you really have to read these things. If this isn't the most unhealthy thing in our kitchen condiments, I don't know what it would be. Look how much salt there is. Look how much high fructose corn syrup. These, these items are listed by weight. So when they list high fructose corn syrup as the number two ingredient, that means that's what it mostly is besides tomato puree. So, so read the labels, know your ingredients and root them out. And one more slide and then I, I have, to, have to let you all go on. Uh, here's here's uh, some, go ahead and advance it there, please, Jonathan. Maybe there isn't any more. Oh, no, here it is. Okay, I wanna mention this Alaska cod in this packaging. It is truly, uh, there's, there's no Chinese or Russian fishery involved if it says Alaska or if it says Atlantic. And so we know the source of this product and we know it to be excellent. And I really do recommend this Alaska cod. The fillets are really marvelous in it. Are, are as good as fresh. Um, all of these ingredients over on the left are, uh, are truly gluten-free. Chutney, ma Major Gray's chutney, key ingredient in it is malt vinegar. So I'm never able to eat, use it, but there, guess what? That's gluten-free mango chutney. So, um, and then my, my point about the herbs is uh, you're, you're you're really no calories are being introduced there. Just don't uh, 
don't keep your, your spices around long. They really do deteriorate. Keep by small quantities of them and pitch them. If, they, if you've still got uh, stuff around from, uh, you know, for, from the last uh, two or three years ago, pitch it. It's just, it's just dust. Go ahead. I'm, I'm out of time, um, but I wanted to go ahead, Jonathan, please. I wanted to give you my email and my uh, phone number. I text and I'd be happy to answer your questions, uh, send your recipes on things or uh, tell you my experiences with products. Um, and um, so I, I really do uh, honor your opinion about whether I uh, gave you some uh some pointers on how to lighten up your cuisine. Um, so give me some feedback and give, pass it on to Lindy uh, and uh, 